If you have your Bible, would you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Today we're still in the series called Learning to Live Like Jesus, and we are in the fruit of the Spirit, talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and we got stuck on love, and we've been on love for five weeks, and we'll be there another few, and then we'll jump to the rest of the gifts, uh, or the fruit of the Spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. I'm going to pray again. We are praying church. We pray a lot here, so get ready. Lord, bless the word. Speak to us, God. I'm asking for your grace and your authority as I speak the word of God and that our hearts would be open in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 says this, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and it is not puffed up. Those are the ones we've done over the last few weeks. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked and thinks no evil. Today we're going to talk about does not behave rudely and does not seek its own. Has anyone in here ever behaved rudely? Has anyone ever done anything where you were thinking about yourself only? The first service was way more honest than you guys, way more. I was in the mall. Um, I've, I don't like the mall. How many men agree? It's a place where life goes to die. And I was in there and I heard a kid talking to her mother about not being able to get the new whatever, thousand dollar phone, and just really being, behaving rudely, just getting at her mom. And I was thinking, man, if I would have done that to my mom or my dad, this is what happened when I behaved rudely in my house. I just want to real quick. When I got into junior high and started to think I was really cool, and I knew more than my dad and my mom. And I would, I remember one time specifically going off and I got, a, I didn't even finish the sentence. And the next thing I know, I wake up on the floor. <laughs> Who dat? Who dare? You know what I mean? Who done that to me? And I remember feeling like, oh, I didn't go cry in my room. I, I went and cried in my room because I knew I deserved it. And we live in a culture where it's like, don't spank a kid, don't hurt a kid. Listen, I'm not saying beat your kid. I'm not talking about child abuse. But if somebody would have given me a timeout in that moment, I would have just went and refueled with rebellion and came right back out of the room with a little more energy. And I'm telling you that there's something that happens when when like a, a father does what he did to me. My dad only spanked me a few times in my life and I deserved it when he did. He was not angry. He was teaching his son to be honoring and respectful which we have lost today in a big way. I'm going to talk today about honor and submission. We have lost honor and submission. And I'm going to tie in some stuff, so hang with me in the message. My mom, if I even went to say anything against my mother, I'm talking, I would hear that little five foot eight man coming down the hallway with those steel feet. I'm not kidding, his feet were made of steel. A boom, boom, boom. And I knew, oh, mom, I was just joking. I'm I'm joking, I'm, I'm kidding. And my dad would go to pull the belt off, you know, remember those days? with a big belt, came out with smoke on it. Remember that? (laughs) And my strategy was always go right for the hip to hug him and hold him and repent because he can't can't get you. You know what I mean? He can't get you. (laughs) Father, you're so amazing. Husbands and wives treating each other rudely and then wondering why our kids treat each other rudely when there's no honor and no respect and treating authority uh, poorly, would you say, with contempt. Our police officers... uh, politicians, people that are in authority over us. And we're talking today about honor. And I, can I, I'm not going to get political, but I am going to say something. Has anybody ever voted for a president that they didn't want to be in office? I mean, you voted for a guy. I'm sorry, let me, re, let me rephrase that. She's like, no, I've never voted. You voted for a guy and he didn't win. Anybody ever had that happen? I'm 50 years old. I've had that happen to me many times. It does, listen, it doesn't mean I agree with their, their policies. There are presidents that we've had that I thought, man, that guy does not think like I think about America. I don't believe in his ways. But guess what I did as a Christian? I prayed for him. I prayed for their family. I blessed them. I asked God to protect them. Why? Because that's what the Bible says to do. It says to pray for those in authority over you. It doesn't say if you voted for them. If you voted for them, bless them. And there, we live in a time, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, we live in a time where we are so divided because we've lost honor and we've lost respect. I honor the office of the president. I do. 
It doesn't mean I agree with every single thing that goes on, but there's, when, when we honor, it releases blessing, and I'm gonna show you in scripture in just a minute. Numbers chapter 12, verse four, if you have your Bible. <clears throat> Numbers 12, verse four. Uh, I, this wasn't part of the message, and I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to put it in here um, a couple days ago. So Aaron and Miriam are outside talking badly and poorly about Moses, their leader. And I'm not talking about this so that I can set myself up to be the leader that you can never question. Do you, do you, do you hear me saying that? Because you know what that is? That's called a cult. When you, you can't question authority. That's called a cult. You run away. So this is what happens, though. They're outside. Nana. Do you think Moses was a perfect man? He's a, he had the hardest pastoring job ever. Million people out in the desert all mad and want to kill him. Numbers 12, verse 4, so immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. How many of you know that's a problem? And the Lord's like, you three, tabernacle, now. (laughs) So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called to them. And they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, listen now to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is, so why uh, are you not afraid to criticize my servant? Talk about just a spanking from the Lord. He brings him in and says, look, this is my guy, and you're criticizing him. And by the way, I heard what you said about him. And the Bible says that he gave Miriam leprosy in that moment. And she had to be outside the camp. She had to be outside and away from everybody. And here's the point I want to make to you. When we don't honor each other and we live rudely and we live self-seeking, what it creates is spiritual leprosy that separates people from one another. When we don't honor our wives and honor our husbands and honor our children and children don't honor mom and dad and we don't honor authority and we don't honor presidents and we don't honor police officers, all it brings in our society is a spiritual leprosy that causes nothing but division and problems. Can you say amen to that? So we have to be very careful about what we say and how we say it. So let's look real quick because love honors. Matter of fact, when Jesus went into the one town, the Bible says he could do very few miracles because of their what? There's a different thing there. There's something bigger than unbelief. There's something a lot bigger than unbelief, and it's the lack of honoring of the Son of God. The Bible says in the rest of the towns, they would say, Jesus, you're the son of God. And they honored him as the son of God. And watch what happened. Miracles and power showed up and he healed their sick and cast out demons and did all kinds of things. And he went to this town and this is what they did. Prove it. No honor. Just prove it. And Jesus said, oh, no, I'll heal this guy. He's got a fever. He's got a little faith. But he did very few miracles. You see, when we create a culture of honor where we're not behaving rudely and self-seeking, please hear me, it releases power in your life. Kids, your mom and dad have been around the block a few more times than you have. You ought to listen to them. I remember when I was dating a girl, right? I didn't date all through high school. I dated Jesus, that's what I said. I really did. I just fell in love with the Lord and I said, I'm not gonna do the dating thing. Met this girl, 18 years old, we started dating, and so my wife hates, hates hearing about this girl. But, and we were getting, getting engaged. And my dad, who said very little, comes into the living room one day and looks at me and says, if you marry that girl, you're going to have problems the rest of your life. Now, my dad was a man of few words, so when he said something, I listened. So I called off the engagement. And a couple years later, I met Cindy. And when I walked, when when my dad met Cindy, um, he was in a hospital bed because he'd had a back surgery. And Cindy was there talking to him. And we went to a Christian concert. When I came home, my dad said, you know what you ought to do, bud? I was like, oh, great. He's going to say, don't marry that girl. You're going to have problems. (laughs) He said, you should marry that girl. And I went, really? I said, thank you. Now, some of you'd go, well, that's weird that your dad chose your wife. He didn't choose her. He wasn't like online. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't really a lot of online back then. Remember those days? Like, nothing was happening. Wow, a blue page came up. Whoa. But he, 
he'd been around the block and he'd seen a few things and made a few mistakes. And you see, when you honor the people that God puts over you, it rescues you from trouble. When you honor people, and we'll, and we'll, we'll talk, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm excited. David and Saul, let's talk about them real quick. So David has been anointed to be king. Picture this, you're 12, 13, 14 years old. Samuel comes, anoints you with oil, and says, you are going to be the next president. And he is the prophet, so you're like, wow. Years go by, and he's serving under the president who hates him. Saul hates David. Watch what happens. So, um, 1 Samuel 19.9. Now, a distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. Why? Because Saul was jealous. He opened his heart up to things that weren't of God. And as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. He was playing his guitar, as he always did, and he was worshiping the Lord. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Pause. You have a prophetic word from God that you're going to be the king. You're serving under the king. And every time the king gets a distressing spirit on him, David would play his guitar and it would soothe and calm down Saul. And this time he was calming him down. And then Saul just takes a spear out of jealousy and throws it towards David. Could you imagine you're just loving the Lord, having your quiet time? What a beautiful name. Whoa, what's going on? A spear hits the wall. David runs, and he runs for years from Saul because Saul was jealous and wanted to kill him. Now watch what happens. This is much later on uh, in time. 1 Samuel 24, verse 2. This is is a, wow. David was a good, good man. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. Could you imagine living in that neighborhood? Where do you live? I live in the rocks of the wild goats. I live in the wild turkey land in my, man, they're dumb. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of this cave. And the men said to David, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand. Then you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose, secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. How cool. You're hiding in a cave. And there are thousands of caves in Israel. And Saul, with his army, happens to come into your cave that you're hiding in. Tell me the Lord didn't set this up. And all of David's men, could you imagine? It's like a movie. They're, they're crouched down behind the rocks and they're, they're trying to hide and Saul falls asleep and David goes over with a knife, cuts his robe. And I love David because what did his heart do? Even that, he's like, oh, this is so wrong. I don't even want to touch the man's robe. He goes back to his men and goes, guys, I can't do this. He's God's anointed, and until he's not God's anointed, I'm submitted to, to him, and I'm going to honor that man. Did Saul deserve honor? No. He deserved emails every day blasted out. He's a jerk, and he's blah, 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 blah. He deserved Facebook posts of how bad he was. But he didn't, did he? He didn't. He goes, I'm going to honor this man. And guys, he had a prophetic promise from God that he was going to be king. And sometimes when we get a promise from God that we take into our heart and say, man, that's the Lord, he's going to do it, we get ahead of the Lord and think that because we have a promise from God, we can ramroad right over the top of people on our way to the promise. And how it works is this, Lord, I'm submitted to you and your will. I am your servant. And who, I had a guy over me when I first got in the ministry, I'm 17 and a half years old, I get hired to be a youth pastor three hours from home, paid, paid staff position, and this guy rebuked me every day of my life, the senior pastor. He rebuked me all the, and I probably needed it, but he rebuked me about everything. And I remember going back to my office and being like so frustrated, like, this guy's a jerk, Lord. You ever called somebody a jerk? And the Lord's like, what? Maybe you're the jerk. I'm not a jerk. And I remember finding that verse from Proverbs that says, and I wrote it down on a card that says, he who ignores correction is stupid. 
So I pinned it to my wall and I said, God, whether the things he says to me are true or not, he's my leader and I'm gonna submit to him. And when he rebukes me, I'm gonna come back and talk to you about the thing he rebuked me about and have you changed my heart. And I'll tell you what the Lord, what, what that releases, that releases blessing and honor instead of spiritual leprosy. And there are many churches where God's moving and God's doing powerful things and little factions rise up within the church because they don't like this and they don't like that and the pastor's not perfect and this guy's not perfect and they're doing this and they're doing that and all it creates is spiritual leprosy in the camp and separation of people. And it prevents us from doing the very thing that God has called us to do, yeah? I wanna give you just a few quick insights. David had practical and natural reasons for taking out Saul. And the danger of his men, be careful about who you surround yourself with because the men around him are like, this is your day, man, kill him. Go after this. And a lot of times when we have a prophetic word from God, we would look at that and go, well, this is my hour. But David knew it wasn't his hour. David knew that he was the Lord's anointed and he couldn't touch him. See, we have to treat prophetic words. Prophetic words, by the way, are not um, inspired like the word of God that we, we can hold to, hold to, hold to. We, on, we, we bless them, we write them down, we wage war, the Bible says, by them. And I've had many, 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 many prophetic words in my life given to me. I've had those prophetic words where you're going to change the world and God's going to use you and you're global and all these things. Man, when you're 12 years old and you hear that, you're like, what? I can't even put my pants on the right way, barely, and I'm going to you know, do all these great things for God. And I've had people even recently tell me, I've had a few prophetic words recently where people have called me and talked to me and said, man, I see the Lord doing this in your life and man, God's going to use you this way in the world and globally. And, and you know what I did when I hung up? Nothing. I hung up and said, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. And I put that on the back burner because why? Because God's in charge of when his promises happen. I'm not going to go self-fulfill. I'm not going to go out and try to have a TV ministry and write books to, be, to become famous and start promoting myself and putting myself in position where I'm wanting to pound my chest. Here's how your prophetic words become reality. You ready? You're faithful every day. You get up and do what Jesus has asked you to do. You get up every day. You love your wife. You love your kids. You, love the, you do what he asks you to do. That's how prophetic words are fulfilled. They're not fulfilled by you. David knew it. He didn't get into the frenzy of the crowd saying, this is your moment. He said, Lord, I can't touch that man. And he waited on God. And God was the one who actually fulfilled it. Yeah? So David understood that he was in submission and that God had a time and a place for everything. So he didn't behave rudely or self-seeking in that moment. He relied on the Lord and submitted to him. Is that right? He had a prophetic word, but he didn't try to self-fulfill that word. He let the Lord do it. I want to read you a verse. Psalms chapter 78, uh, verse 41. Again and again they tested God's patience and frustrated the Holy One of Israel. Here's what it says in the New King James. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I got a question for you. Is God powerful? Yes. Is he all powerful? Yes. Can he do whatever he wants to whomever he wants, whenever he wants? Yes. How, how come it right there, it just says they limited him. They limited the Holy One of Israel. People have said to me, Pastor Rick, if God wants to get something done, he'll just get it done. We don't really have to pray and be obedient and love each other and get in the word because it's sovereign and God will do whatever he wants. And I go, really? Watch the children of Israel. God had a plan for them to receive the promised land and it took them how many years? 40. Why? Because they kept being self-seeking and rude. They kept, they kept, they kept bickering and arguing and coming at each other and they just spiritual leprosy filled the camp and they limited the Lord. I'm gonna tell you, we as a people can limit what God does here because of how we respond. People yip and yap and talk and boom, 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 boom. It's big in our area, by the way. Gossip is part of human nature, but this area, there's something about this area with, with the gossip. And I'm gonna just be straight with you. Is that cool? We gotta stop it. It's limiting the Holy One. It's limiting what he can do in our midst because we're not walking and stepping in tune with what the Spirit of God is saying, yeah? How many are still coming back next Sunday? Okay, good. <laughs> I remember uh, just 
Nah, never mind. I'm going to hold off on that one. Sometimes you get a little check. <laughs> I want to give you four quick things to walk out of a rude, selfish attitude. They're four, and they're easy, and they're practical, and I think they're good. Number one, if you feel the desire to be rude, this is so powerful, this is so amazing. Stop it. We always want this heavy spiritual, oh, I was going to be rude and I got Holy Ghost chicken skin and all of a sudden I, I got this verse from heaven and a rainbow appeared and I just felt man, fantastic. No, there's just times you just got to stop it. I remember Cindy and I were going into Hawaii, uh, or yeah, we were coming in or leaving, I don't yeah, we were coming in, I think. And it was a few years ago and we're, you know, you stand at the podium and the guy checks your license and all that, well... My wife walked up before me, and this guy was probably the rudest human being I've ever seen. He was such a jerk. I mean, he was so rude. And I, he doesn't know we're married. I'm just standing there watching this guy. And I'm, I said, Lord, how shall I proceed? <laughs> how shall I proceed with this one? And he's just really rude to her. And Cindy looks back at me and gives me the look. And I'm like, I got you. So then it was my turn, and I stepped up to the podium, and I handed him my driver's license, and he started in on me like he was in on her. I said, hey, bud. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, wait a second. You're a public servant. We're here on vacation, and maybe you shouldn't have a job where you're out with the public because you're not very good with the public. How about a smile that you have a job, and you work for the government, which is even better. Why don't you give me a little smile, buddy? Why don't, you, why don't you be kind? I'm coming to Hawaii. Aloha. You know, I'm giving him the whole, I'm giving him the whole lowdown. And as I walked away, I said to him, you should have a better day. And, and you know how you feel your blood boiling? I was actually really good. Cindy was like, you were very good. You didn't punch him. I did get strip searched. Uh... What I realized is they have authority, and they're like, we're going to need you in the back. And I was like, oh, what's going on? Whenever you see that rubber glove, you're like, ooh. <laughs> Just stop it. I've heard, I've seen people be so rude out in public. I'm like, just quit it. It's not Jesus, man. Number two, recognize God's authority in your life. I've already said it. Recognize his authority, that he is in charge of the timing of things for your job, for your marriage, for your life. Just, just, just recognize God's authority. Number three, recognize his placement. He's put people in your life, over your life, and around you. Just be submissive and let the Lord bless you. So recognize his placement and four, submit to one, in, to one another. I'm gonna read you a quick, quick few verses in closing. Colossians 3.18. <clears throat> Wives, Submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. How many of you wives just went, <laughs> Can I break this down for you? And, and this will help you. Husbands, listen to me. Right? I'm going to throw, I'm about to throw some nuggies your way, okay? Not chicken nuggets, gold nuggets. So just, just hang with me. We think wives submit to your husband is this. Husband on top of the wife. Just, I'm in charge. And she's under my feet. That is not biblical it is this and my wife is the master of this I remember the day my wife said you want to do that you want to buy that yeah okay I was like really Ooh. she goes well you you answer to the Lord for that because you're the head of the household I remember the fear of the Lord coming over me I'm standing there looking at the bag of Doritos should I buy these yeah, I probably should. I probably should. Nacho cheese. <laughs> it's so good. Guys, if we're submitted to the Lord as husbands, if we're submitted to Jesus and we're, he's the Lord and we pray and we worship and we want his will and we're hearing God, our wives will submit to us so easily. They'll just be, yeah, it frees them from having to always try to control you because you're under the authority of the Holy Spirit. But guys, if you're not walking with Jesus, no wonder your wife, there's a little, little tornado in your life because you're not doing things right. But wives, I want to say this to you. It's his responsibility before God. You can, it's yours, buddy, take it. So wives, submit to your husbands. 
And husbands, submit to the Lord, yeah? And love your wife as Christ uh, loved the church. That's a lot of dying, fellas. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 17, this is talking about pastors. And I'm not trying to preach this to, to, to get myself boasted up. It's in the word we ought to talk about it. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch out for your souls. In other words, submit to your pastor. Now, I've had people come to me and say, hey, Pastor Rick, we're really thinking about buying a new car. What do you think? I don't care. <laughs> That's weird. That's cult. I remember there was a big movement back in the day of this heavy submission stuff. Where the pa There's 2,000 people in our church. I don't want you all coming to me asking, is it okay to buy a car? I don't want you coming to me, hey, pastor, we're thinking about changing the trim color on our house. Can we get some prayer on that? <laughs> no, go to Kelly Moore, pick out a thing and paint your house. Go to Toyota, get a deal. Now, I've had people come to me and say, pastor, we're thinking about moving. We're thinking about leaving, selling our business. Will you pray with us? We want to hear your heart. And I go, why, why do you want to move? Taxes. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> I can't move because the Lord said you're called here. I can't go to Arizona where you pay less tax and can buy a mansion for $20. <laughs> and I would say to them, well, do you have a great church? Have you found a great church there? I always tell people, don't, don't move for a job. Find your church first because that's going to be the most important thing in your life. Your job's a dime a dozen. They're all over the place. See where you're connected and stay there, yeah? So, and there's one verse that actually says, don't make it hard for those that oversee you. Don't make it difficult for them in their job. And I would just say to you, amen. <laughs> James chapter four, verse seven, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I love this. So watch this. How do you overcome a rude attitude and, and self-seeking? You submit to God. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Watch this. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I have bad news for you. He comes back sometimes. You think it's a one-time resistance. It's not. It's an over and over again. I submit to you, Lord. I submit to you, Lord. I resist you, enemy, in the name of Jesus. But watch what happens. When we are submitted to the Lord, it releases power and not death. When we are unsubmitted to Jesus and we're constantly just giving in to temptation, it creates trouble in our life. Amen? So submit to God. In 1 Peter 5, verse 5, last verse. <clears throat> in the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you dress yourself in humility as you relate to uh, one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up and honor you. We're supposed to be submitted one to another under the authority of the Lord. I remember uh, when we first got our wiener dog. He is 13 years old now. And uh, he doesn't know he's a dog. He really does not know he's a dog. I'm serious. He, I lift him up in the mirror and he looks at himself like, what is that? <laughs> what is that hairy thing you're holding? And uh, he's the sweetest thing on earth. But when he was little, how many of you ever had a little gnarly puppy? They they're they're kind of fight you and bite you a little bit when they're... And so here's this little... He's German. That's why he's all up tight. He, he's just all up tight. And uh, he was a little puppy. And I remember I'd be laying on the floor. And here come Pogo. Bounding over stuff. I mean, jump on me and start biting me and nipping at me. And I remember watching Caesar Milan. The little dog whisperer guy. And I did that... And all it did is made him mad. It made him so mad. I would do this, he'd be on the ground, I'd be like, Psst. and he would, he'd attack me. I was like, Caesar, man, what do you got that I don't got? And one day I was watching the show and he said, if you have a puppy and it's freaking out, it wants dominance. It wants to rule the house. So what mamas do is they bite them on the neck right here and you just grab, use your hand because it feels like teeth and you just grab them and you hold them down. I was like, all right, Caesar. That's what I'm doing next time this dog comes at me. I'm laying on the floor, and here he comes. I see him out of the corner of my eye. He always had little paws before he would attack me. And he'd come running, and I saw him, and he comes to jump at me. I grab him. I hold him down on the ground. Now realize, I'm, it's not a German shepherd. It's a baby 
baby wiener dog. He's this big. <laughs> I act like I'm fighting a bear. Oh, I had him on the ground. And I, I reached down and I thought, I'm doing this right. I'm doing this right. So I bit him. <laughs> I grabbed him right under here with these teeth. I just went, ah and I had a hold of his hair and skin, and, I, and, I, and he was fighting, he was wrestling, he was scratching, and they're long, so he was, his body was winging around out here, and I'm, I just have a hold of him, and literally, I don't know how long we were there, but we were there for a long time, and, and all of a sudden, he goes like this, and he just went totally, totally just submitted. I stood up. He looked at me for weeks after that. Every time I'd walk in the house. <laughs> guess who's in charge? 13 years later, guess who's in charge? I'm daddy. I'm papa in that house. Why? Because he ain't going to do that again. It probably scarred him for life. Why is this human being biting me on the neck? This is so crazy. This guy's, my master's nuts. There's an authority, watch this, and this, this is going to make sense. It's a terrible, this is a terrible illustration, but when we are unsubmitted and we just run around and do whatever we want and bite and devour, the Bible says don't bite and devour one another. Isn't that amazing? Galatians, be careful not to use your mouth because if you bite and devour one another, you're going to, it's spiritual cannibalism, you're going to, you're, the Lord's not going to move in your midst. And just like that dog, there has to come a point where you just submit and go, you know what, Lord, you're in charge. I have leaders over me. I have a district supervisor. I have a president. I have uh, a vice president in our denomination. Those guys could call me today, and, and, and I, I will love and honor and respect them. There are decisions they make sometimes. I go, oh, man, what are they doing? And you know what the Lord always reminds me? You're not the president of Foursquare. Why do you have to worry about that? Why are you worrying yourself with something you have no authority over? And I go, well, because I have an opinion. <laughs> he goes, well, you know what? You better lie down and let me get on that neck or you're going to start creating some trouble. <laughs> are you seeing what I'm saying? We want to be unsubmitted and in the body of Christ just running around biting people. And there comes a point where we just got to lay down before the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to be rude and self-seeking. And the only way to not do that is to be submitted to you and honor those around me because your love is released through that and the kingdom comes through that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Two people clapped. It was awesome. There was, I heard, I heard, no, you don't have to clap. You don't have to clap. You do not have to clap. Uh, we're not clap happy. It, it doesn't, I just heard one guy like, oh, I guess this isn't the time. This, isn't, <laughs> this is not what we're doing right now. We're not doing the clap thing. Father, we love you, and uh, Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you that you're so patient with us and so kind with us, that you don't behave rudely towards us. God, you seek our best. And I pray for everyone in this room that, God, we would love you the way that we're called to, that, Lord, we would honor each other and we would protect each other and we would bless each other because, God, we want to see revival, and we're never going to see revival if we don't understand the principle of loving one another, honoring one another, and submitting. So God, help us to be filled with your love. Father, I pray blessing upon every person here. With all eyes closed, I just want to make sure that you, if you're in here and you've never received Jesus, that maybe today would be the day you'd want to do that. And I want you to hear me. There was no one else more submitted than Jesus. He was submitted to his father, and his father said, Son, the only way to get these people back is for you to die for them. And he sought you. The moment that he died on a cross for you, it was the love of God seeking you out because he knew that without him, you have no hope. You have no hope. You have no forgiveness. You have no freedom. You are just bound to this world and its ways. And God came and rescued you through his son, Jesus. And he loves you. And if today you would say, man, I want to come home. Maybe you've backslidden. Or I just need Jesus. My eyes are going to move through this audience. And if that's you, would you just raise your hand up real quick? Just acknowledge real fast. We're going to, we're going to blaze through this. I'm starting. I'm going to start. Yeah, I see your hand way over there. Good, good, good. Yeah. 
Yes, good, yeah, I see your hand. Anybody else? You wanna say yes to the Lord today? Yeah, good, I see your hand too. Anyone else? Good, yep, yeah, awesome, bro. Nicely done. Anyone else? Far left, your left. You wanna say yes to Jesus, good. For those of you that raise your hand, just look at me for a sec, there's like seven of you or eight of you or whatever. When you leave this building, you're gonna go out through the courtyard and as you're going up into the parking lot, you're gonna see a sign that says, I said yes, right by the water fountain. There's just a table there. There's gonna be a couple of great people there. They wanna give you a little booklet, pray with you. They're not gonna ask for anything, nothing weird. You don't give your social security number, or ATM pin code or anything like that. It's just, we just wanna help you. I challenge you to go do this. This is a huge step in your walk with God. This is a, just a massive step in your walk with the Lord. So take the person who brought you if you don't wanna go alone and go do that. Father, we love you. You're so kind, you're so good. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Next weekend, we are gonna come to you prepared with a list of things. We're doing some research this week of what the fire victims need in Napa Valley because we don't want to just give, throw money and throw stuff around. We want to know exactly what they need. And so baby formula right now is what I've heard and diapers are the biggest need um, because that stuff's expensive. So if you know somebody that owns a baby formula place, maybe you ought to talk to them about doing some donating because they're really struggling. So we're going to come with a list and a way for you to respond to help the fire victims. Amen. Next weekend. So God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you.